Hello and welcome to another episode of What If It's Cool, the show where we talk about anything and everything that's cool in the world today. I am the Dr. Evil, that is Daniel Paul Crow. With me is the evil twin of Ben, that is Trip B. And last and least, the evil Uno of the cast, Tim. How are we doing, boys? Yeah, not nice. bad. Nice, I got the and least. I think he's starting to nail these intros. Yeah, these are, Thank these you. are great. Have you listened yeah. to all of them, Trip? No, I can't say I have. But um, from the ones I've had listened to, I think this one's probably the least cringy, maybe. Yeah, this yeah. is this is tight. You know, this is yeah. a real step up. I know. At least you weren't introduced as a cheerleader. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I could have made it worse, but I thought I'll, I'll you know try 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 my best to ma- make it relevant to what we're doing today. So, what are we doing today? Oh man, I, I hate both of you guys for this because in a, in, a, in a previous episode we had mentioned the second one and we're now doing the first one of the Conjuring series and I I had to watch it twice and watch I had to watch it oh what is it now it was probably about the last nine hours ago and I am still looking over my shoulder every couple of minutes. So is, is, is that it? I, I, I'm t- I'm still I'm still pretty scared, man. Like, <laughs> like I I'm so glad I'm so glad that you decided to watch this one though, because I know that you don't really like horror films. And... I, I don't mind I don't mind horror films, but anything that has to do with possession, you know, like say like The Exorcist, this movie that that this scares me to the core, simply because. Growing up, my parents, especially my mum and my older brother, Lester, speaking of which, Lester, if you're listening to this, thank you for making my life a living hell when I was a kid by telling me these possession stories. They used to tell me so much things that used to happen in the Philippines with possession. Like, anything, there's nothing else that scares me more than hearing a possession story. It, it really chills me to the core. I think, I think I know what it is. It's probably because movies like this tend to hit a lot closer to home. Whereas, yeah. When you, yeah, when you deal with other supernatural things, so things like, you know, vampires, werewolves, there's a huge disconnect there because you know that that stuff doesn't happen. Whereas when you've grown up with stories about people getting possessed, yeah, like it probably touches on that, that childhood fear that you would have developed back then. Oh, man. Like I grew, I grew up in a very, very Catholic household. And man, just some of the things that were said, not just by my mum or my brother, but just like family in general, like there is some stuff that will keep you up at night. And I'm, I, I, I'm, when I start having kids, I'm making sure that they don't hear these stories because I, I've yet to meet anybody who can even top the, some of the stories that they've told me. It's just that scary, man. Well, I, I don't, I don't think those are really appropriate stories that should be told to a kid. <laughs> I was, I was five years old when they started telling me this, man. You exactly. don't tell this and to kids at that age. At least you've made that decision to not share those sorts of stories with children. Man, imagine if my if my mum was still alive. I, I can't imagine what kind of kind of stuff she was saying to my kids. I should probably be telling us these stories now and just be like, oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> glad for the share. But I was actually going to ask. <laughs> I was going to ask Trip. So in in Chinese culture is you know the hopping vampires is that real? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, just like uh, the zombies and trolls and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hang on, hang on. What what what's this hopping vampire stuff? Oh, uh, hopping vampires. Yeah, I don't never heard of this. Well, haven't you seen any like eighties movies of uh, like the Chinese vampire hunters? Like, nah, I I haven't watched those yet. Oh no, oh. they're great. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that that's a future episode right there. Well, I've heard so many good things about Mr. Vampire, but I've never heard of hopping vampires, so this is a new one. Well, there's a reason for that because Chinese culture they believe that because when they die, there's rigor mortis, so everything is stiff, so they can't actually run and walk like a normal person. So they they need to hop in order to get towards a person. It's hilarious. I mean, I think that was basically Chinese Hong Kong cinema in the eighties was just pretty much 80% that and then 20% just action films with Jackie Chan in it. And um, yeah, it was... I guess that was their slasher film. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. That's a good way to put it. 
All right. So with this uh, with this movie, so uh, who's who's going to be who's going to be giving the storyline? Well, you know, considering it was your idea, why don't you give us a go, Sunshine? <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, nice. This is this is this is how you delegate. I'm I'm really glad you know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So the the movie is directed by James Wan, and it is taken from the case files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, who are respected. And I'm, I put that in inverted commas because of what they faced in real life, but they're considered quite respected voices in the field of paranormal research. The movie takes place, well, it opens in 1968, and then it opens with one of their, one of their first cases, which involves the Annabelle doll. Interestingly, they had a, a more horrific looking doll created for this film because the Annabelle doll in real life is actually a Raggedy Ann doll. Yeah. So you don't, you know, with this one, you see it. The camera sort of opens, and the first shot that you see is of like a sort of cracked glass eye of this Annabelle doll, and you know, it looks it it looks demonic. <laughs> like I would not want something like that around my house. <laughs> and you, and not to mention, it spawned like a, yeah, movies of its own afterwards, spin-off series. It's got yeah. three now. Yeah. Three. Yeah. In total. Yeah, Annabelle, then you had Annabelle Creation, and then which is a prequel to the first Annabelle, and then Annabelle, and Annabelle Comes, Comes Home. Annabelle Comes Home. Which, which actually features uh, Patrick Wilson and, and Vera Farmiga as, as Ed and Lorraine Warren, respectively. So it's kind of like, you know, like a sidequel to this, to this series. Yeah, so they, you know, you get a, you get a, a sense of the, the sort of dread that James Wan can develop out of this particular case. And, this is only the opening minutes of the film. It's not even the main thing. And what you learn is that he start he sort of sets up with one of their first cases before going into the main story. And that was a that was a storytelling technique that he replicated in the sequel, Conjuring Two. But for the main the main part of this story, it involves the haunting that goes on in the in the new home of the Perron family. And it is freaky. It is without a doubt one of the freakiest movies that I've seen. I still remember going to the cinema to watch this. And movies like this, they, they need to be watched in a cinema setting. You need to watch it with an audience with you. If you watch this movie on your own, yeah, you're going to get scared. But I still remember sitting in the cinema and the guy behind me was just going, like for every single bit where it would start to get really scary, he'd just be sitting there going, oh, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. And yeah, you know, I, I could just I I couldn't help but laugh to myself because I was thinking this guy's saying exactly how I'm feeling <laughs> the whole way through. It just every mo like you know it just it, oh man it ratchets up the tension. It gets it just gets you feeling like you know something's you know you 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 start to you start to tense up because you're thinking of the scare that's going to come, and it has a really. I would say that it has a very effective use of jump scares. Jump scares tend to be the norm in a lot of horror movies these days. But this one, I think it, it spaces it out quite well. And, you know, the, the haunting stuff that you do see is, is very, it, like, it's very effective and chilling. It, it, like, I've still, I'm still thinking about, like, how the hairs on my arm were just standing up during certain scenes in this. I think you, I think you hit the nail in the coffin there when it comes to, like, watching this in a cinema. I think I probably would have found this less scary if I did because, you know, I'll get distracted by people doing that. I, like, I remember when I saw The Nun, um, I was with uh, some members of my family and I just, and they were sitting there going, ah, ah, and I just sat there and just had a good laugh at them and I just totally forgot they were watching a horror movie. I think that may have helped my experience on that one, but yeah, this is not a movie I want to watch alone. Not at all. And one thing you touched on, Tim, I think what makes it really what what they do really well is just the build up of the tension and yeah what makes it such a great experience in the cinema is the use of surround sound in that like you can literally hear like a left speaker where you can where there's like footsteps and then it slowly makes its way to the right hand side of the speaker and i guess like if you try to replicate that that at home i think if you do have a surround system at home i think it'll be equally as scary it probably scare you enough not to not to sleep at night but yeah but i guess like you know yeah in the dark with 
everyone else. And you know, there's going to be, yeah, you're going to get a few people screaming in the cinema as well. That probably adds to the effect of it as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the use of sound in this is probably something that I wanted to highlight as well, especially when we start talking about what happens throughout the course of the film. But there were, cause I, cause I've got surround sound here. I've been, uh, I've been really happy with listening to movies play out because yeah, like when you, when you hear how they, how they divide up the sound in each channel, you know, you get a sense of you know moving from left to right or things like that are behind you and what, and what have you. But even, even just the bit where, so later on, much later on in the film, they've set up all of their ghost catching sort of equipment. Well, you know, recording equipment and they've got record, they've got uh, microphones and in each of the rooms and the way that they're trying to observe the rooms, they're, they're slowly raising the volume. And, you know, whenever you, hear, you raise the volume on certain devices, you know, you just hear like, you know, this, well, it's deafening, you know, like this deafening silence. Well, no, no, it's not like someone hocking up Flam Dan, <laughs> but yeah, you hear this deafening silence happening. And I like just to hear the way that that sound was replicated on surround sound here, I was like, oh, that's, that's really awesome. But the the movie when it when it started with the Perron family, almost immediately you're getting little signs and tidbits that something's not quite right with this house. What did, what did you guys what did you guys pick up with this? Oh yeah, look, I mean, I think that's what makes it. I think that's what makes it so good. I think is that there's it starts off with little things, but then it just escalates. Before I go on ahead, though, I mean, how much am I meant to spoil? Like, oh, just, you... we're just doing the movie. Like, we've... Uh, dude, I mean, hey, man, I, I love dogs. The moment they kill the freaking dog, I'm like, breaks my heart, man. I mean, <laughs> the only the only thing that dies in the whole freaking movie is a freaking dog. Yeah, man. Justice dude. justice for Sadie. We need some justice for Sadie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, when, when, whenever, whenever they did say that, and, I th- and for those who are not... Uh, from Australia, probably won't get this reference, but ever, any time they said Sadie, did you ever, like, in the back of your mind, start singing the, the Farnham song? No. Sadie, the cleaning lady. I couldn't stop doing that. I I know I know it's a bit corny, I know it's a bit corny, but I just literally could not, do, like, that was the only way I got through a couple of those scenes, because every time they would say Sadie, I would say, like, okay, just sing that, you'll be fine. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah, just keep swimming, basically, for you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the the dog, like, as soon as you have a dog and then the dog is unwilling to go into the house, why would you even move there? Why would you move yeah. in, people? You know, trust the dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog's got that, that, you know, that evil eye or the sixth sense for these sorts of things. And th- after you see that, you're just like, oh, yeah, okay, you know, like, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start picking up. But I think it was, it, it, it didn't escalate too quickly. So mm. the way that the haunting progresses, it's so it's done so measured, mm. and and the fact that he could really escalate that sense of of dread and fear and what have you in each of the segments because it like when you know as I was observing it, it was happening on on on, on a nightly basis. But then yeah, of mm. course, again the escalation. But you know you you just get so many things that happen here and you're just like oh man like these people really need to get out <laughs> <laughs> I, I i did uh, but i do i did want to say like did you guys pick up on the the camera work so when when the peron family first moves into the house you see i think the eldest daughter she's getting something from the car and then the removalists are lifting the couch and then the camera follows her did you did you like the tracking like how it just sort of followed in one single take, how it followed each and showed, you know, certain rooms in the house and, and, you know, like, well, basically establishing the shot, you know, it's just, it's establishing the family. Yeah. I thought it was good. Yeah. Like I, I just keep, I just keep noticing a lot of one takes now. And yeah, this one, I mean, it's a short one, but it's mm. really good at establishing the size of this family. Yeah. I think that's, that's a, that's a very good point. But, and I think, I think it's a, it's a technique that is not really utilized uh, that much in any film genre to be honest but horror seems to be doing it really well like every film that we've done that's a horror film that does that it's it's always executed really well i actually watched conjuring 2 last night and similar to how he did the tracking shot of the peron family as they're moving into their house he did something quite very very similar with mm. the the house in enfield in in the conjuring 2 
So yeah, he sort of goes from the street up through the window. I want to know how they do those shots where they go through the window. I think they do very smart edits, like, yeah. But I think, yeah, it has to be special effects, right? Like, Well, I was talking with, uh, with your brother about the Thing prequel and, you know, the use of the use of the special effects in that and how it just looked absolutely terrible. But yeah, I mean, with this, they, they just used practical effects as much as they could to achieve what it was that they wanted. So like that, I mean, that even just extended to the makeup. Some of the makeup mm. was effective because of how grotesque they made, they made Carol and the mother look. Yeah. It's the lighting and the makeup. I mean, that's what makes it as, but, and also, yeah, the build up to the scares is what makes it. And I think, and I think you'll probably talk about it later on. It's just when you're expecting something is going to happen, it kind of flips it on his head because, you know, like when it comes to horror movies or jump scares, you said, oh, yeah, you know what? The music stopped. Something's going to jump out. But then <laughs> they, there's a few twists and turns throughout this movie, which I really appreciated about them. And speaking of tracking, like I love when they're, whenever they're like, I think this and also in Conjuring 2 as well, um, certain shots when they're just running through the house, just following them as well, that you can see the pace of it and you can, you feel like you're part of the family running with them as well but yeah. even the stationary shots where they're just seeing certain things fall over and stuff i mean that's what i really love about the series it's just yeah also the use of darkness the use of darkness the you know th there's one there's one scene in this where you know one of the daughters sits up in bed and she's just staring off into into the corner of the room now the door is open but yeah, she's she's staring at some some entity that's hiding in the shadows. You don't actually get a, a sense of what it is, but she can definitely see it. Mm. I mean, it's just it's so well acted, you know. Like just seeing all of this, you you actually find that it is quite believable that this family are being haunted by by a demonic presence mm. because it plays with a lot of things with Catholicism. You know, like at around 3.07, the clocks all stop in this. The clock I noticed actually w was focused on in Conjuring 2 as well at about 3.07. And yeah, they said that, you know, you know 3 o'clock, it's like the witching hour. So, you know, that's when that's when a lot of that activity starts to ramp up. And yeah, just seeing the way that they they played out some of these scares was just incredible. And, you know, it's a, it was a real treat. I was happy to watch it again. It's, it's funny, like, how we talk about the effects and everything. It's like it, the... Studios tend to go with a lot of CGI, go with a lot of prosthetics and everything, but this movie d seems to use the simplest techniques and it, it's more effective doing the simple techniques than, say, getting any CGI. I mean, like the, like you just p touched up about the lighting. Like, I don't think we, I don't think there's been many movies where you can just be scared of, of the light or the darkness, you know, like like the way this one was. And the, the scene where the Warren's daughter is you know by herself and then the whole room goes dark like that oh man was that was that a scary bit and that, and that's just and that's just and that's just just simple effects yeah well it's the light that the light that goes out but then the darkness starts to sort of encroach or you know it, almost enveloping her yeah yeah it was oh it was done it was done very well in that scene when we see the stuff that happens with the Peron family I mean, it's even just like something like, you know, the daughter getting her leg pulled out of bed, you know, like, or, you know, like sheets coming off and what have you. The door slamming, the, the paint, paint, the paintings fall down. Yeah. You know, the, the door slamming three times. The That's... laundry, like when these, when she's hanging the sheets. Oh my gosh. That was, yeah, yeah. When that happened, I was just like, oh no, just get, get me out of here. This is. <laughs> 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 I, I tried to Google to see what how they achieved that, but yeah, like uh, as as far as some people could tell, like this is short of me actually just digging up the the Blu-ray and then listening to the commentary. But yeah, like a lot of people on Reddit, they were just like, yeah, that that was probably like a very very minimal use of of special effects, like you know where a dude might have been in a suit so the sheet could fly on them, but then yeah, like through editing, remove the person so that the sheet could fly away. But even the sheet, it kind of looked CGI. I don't know, but. You know, like I, I don't have enough time to research these things as much as I as much as I would like. But the the bit that would have creeped me out, I think. Ah, oh, look, there's a lot of stuff that creeped me out about this. But what about that hide and clap game that the girls are playing? Now, hang on. 
Did any of you guys play that game going up? Because I've never heard of it, and there's no chance in hell I would ever play a game like that. No, I, I've never played a game like that. It, no. This was set in the 70s, wasn't it? Yeah, well, like, I mean, movie opens up in 68, so yeah, like it's. I don't think it's a game that's been played here. Yeah, okay. Maybe like mur- Murder in the Dark or something. Yeah, I mean, it'd be, it'd be useless on me because I'm, I'm deaf in one ear, so it's just like, you're clapping, I was like, oh, where, where, where's that coming from? But it just seems like a game that's so, so mind-bendingly scary. I would, I, I, why would you play that? Especially in a house like that. Like, there's stairs, there's all the, like, you know, when it, when they first played, they ended up breaking um, the board that was connected to the basement, you know? Like, I, I just, I can't imagine kids playing that game and, and, and living, you know, for a very long time. I can just imagine people falling downstairs doing crap. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, it's just, I mean, it was, it was, it was something that was used to push the narrative along. You know, the, the kids are playing this game. It leads to the reveal that there's actually a boarded up basement. Again, it's another sign that you guys should just get the hell out of this house. Oh, I love, I love the elucidation. Oh, I wonder why it's weird. Oh, I wonder why. Oh, anyway, we at least oh, have yeah, more space. Yeah, Let's well. go. <laughs> <laughs> Glass is half full for him, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the uh, there are just little bits and pieces that you know that I was noting, and you know, of course, you know, the viewer was noting as though as they were progressing through the film. But you know, there's the you know the interruptions during sleep, you know, leg getting pulled out of bed, or the dad hearing the three bangs on the wall that would repeat throughout the night. The clocks would stop. You know, there was the one of the youngest of the daughters. She was sleepwalking and you know, sort of banging her head into this dressing cabinet. Birds flying into the house, like you know, the, or the dog mysteriously dying. And then it, I actually noted this one down, but I just thought that there was a conversation that the dad was having on the phone, and then I think he was getting shortchanged on his rate to do one of his trucking jobs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I just kind of, I kind of thought about it, and I was like, oh, maybe. Maybe the stuff that's going on with them right now is even affecting their fortune. What would you? What do you guys think? Well, they were saying that the spirits would attack you mentally, physically, and, and uh, spiritually, and I think you know the physically would have been that. And I, I think you're right, but uh, that never occurred to me uh, to what fell on the first watch or even on the second one. So I think I think you hit the nail on the coffin on that one. Mm. Well, like you know, it just sort of. Like when you're when you're looking at these sorts of movies that deal with superstition and you know, religion, even like in Chinese films, you know, you sort of note that like you know, well, you know, feng shui could be could be affected. And I just sort of thought, okay, like these guys have just moved into quite possibly the most haunted house in at least that state, and every little thing that every misfortune that is falling upon them is probably a, you know a, a, probably to do with this house. But I just, uh, I, I just, I love how they actually lay out the rules. So, like any good horror film, this one explains the rules quite well. So after, and we need to talk about this this night before the mother of of the Perron family, Carolyn, she decides to seek out the Warrens' help. But the rules of possession were laid out. So Dan, you were you were just mentioning that before. You know, number one, and they even number it. It's so helpful. <laughs> but, <laughs> But number one, there's the infestation. So that's where you hear the whispering, etc. Then number two is the oppression. Victim is targeted specifically, usually the weakest one. Number three, then it leads through to possession. So when the person's weak enough, that's when the possession takes place. And that's how this movie is really structured. You know, so even though it's an exposition dump, it is such an effective one because now you can relate to everything that these people are going through. But yeah, like the mm. one of the one of the things that that really freaked me out before the the Perron family meet the Warrens was that final night leading into you know that final night of haunting activity. So you know the wife has got more of the mysterious bruises. She's getting ready for bed, hearing kids playing and laughing. Now this should be another hint for you to just get the hell out. But you know <laughs> I'm not going to say that a lot. But you know she's hearing all this laughter and playing. But then she's going through all the rooms and the kids are all asleep. Like, I just bit, sorry. Like, I, <laughs> I hear, I hear a cracking, I, I just hear like a cracking noise in my own house. I'm just like, someone's here. 
<laughs> but but with this, like, you know, all the kids are are sound asleep in bed. Oh, dude, you've just got to you've just got to pack them all up. Just leave a note for leave a note for your husband to say, gone down to the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> not staying here anymore you know like, oh man like you know all this all this stuff just starts escalating you know you, you see like she's going down the stairs all the picture frames just fall off and smash you know then you know she's hearing furniture moving around uh, the the door to the basement opens by itself and she hears piano sounds from the basement i'm like nah screw that that's just, screw that going home like, that's just Bye-bye. that's just a, that's just a whole lot of nope for me i was just not, <laughs> not not sorry I'm, I'm out i'm bailing but the i think maybe one of the scariest bits in this would have to be the call back to that hide and clap game because carolyn goes into the basement and then you know the lights go out well no firstly she hears something and then you know she threatens them she tries to run up but then the door slams in her face and then she falls all the way down the lights go out a ball just gets tossed to her and she's freaking out. You know, the light just blows. Here's the kid's laughter again. Then all of a sudden she's right up at the top of the steps, but she can't get out and she's lighting matches. <laughs> and again, the play with the, you know, the, the playing with the light and the darkness. And then, you know, suddenly someone says, Hey, you want to play hide and clap? And then these hands just appear out of the darkness and clap right next to her face. And then she's screaming and then camera cuts to outside that basement door. I was, I thought she was dead. <laughs> I thought, you know, on the first watch, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, like that, you're never going to hear from her again. Like, just that, just that sense of doom. When the, 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 the camera pans out from the door after that and you hear her screaming, the, the screaming becomes like less and less and then this door stops shaking. I thought she was dead. Mm. So I'm with you on that one. And then I was surprised that, you know, that she was still alive when, uh, Roger comes to the uh, Roger her husband uh, comes to the to the house and he's screaming and then she's all of a sudden she's banging on the door like like it's time tomorrow I went, what just happened like it, it, I thought she was dead but yeah maybe it's just a this I uh, look I, I don't know if you guys might have thought this like on this rewatch but I kind of found that to be a bit of a plot hole because look she's already in a weakened state you know she's she's got more of the mysterious bruising. I kind of felt like the way that that shot ended with the, you know, you, know, you hear the banging on the door and her screaming and stuff while the camera's panning away from the ba- the shut basement door. I, f- I would have thought that the possession could have taken place at that moment. But as we, as we find out later on, of course, that doesn't happen. But I just kind of thought that, well, she's trapped there. But then when the husband comes home, she's suddenly out. Like it just didn't, like it didn't have... There could be a must- another missed opportunity to do something like that. Yeah, like it just felt like there wasn't an explanation for how she got out. Like she just magically appeared in the room with everyone. Well, you know, she ran to her daughter's aid. But th- that bit, though, like that bit when when the eldest daughter is putting to bed the sleepwalking sister, mm. and then she hears the cabinet door. Oh my god! Like I I I reckon I reckon people piss themselves watching this. I think that was that was my favorite scene because. That was the biggest scare I had throughout the whole movie because you weren't expecting it. You, th- you were expecting something to jump out of the cabinet, but then when you open it, and there's nothing there. Then you realize, okay, when she closes it or something, it's going to be behind her. But then still nothing there. And then when you finally look up, it's like, F- yeah, <laughs> dude, dude, get out. No, no, no. And that no. face, dude, get that out. face no. is just. Sure. Uh, the makeup like it just looked like yeah. well it kind of reminded me of reagan from the exorcist like when she's yes. like fully possessed yeah. be- but like you know this one was like had that that really really wicked smile before she leaps off the top of the dressing cabinet onto the onto the eldest daughter's character i was just like oh my like up to now it still freaks me out i don't know how there are people who don't think that this movie's freaky like have you guys have you have you have you guys spoken to anyone who thinks that this movie isn't scary at all? Yeah, my niece, my niece, my niece and my nephew. I've got a couple of nieces who just think, you know, like they they don't they don't find it scary at all. Like they actually laugh at this movie. But there's always um, that. Looks there's like, always looks that like one our producer person. doesn't think that our producer doesn't think it was that scary. He actually looks like he really loved it. There, yeah, there are some people. There are some people who just think that these movies aren't that scary. Like I had a manager who I used to work with, and we were like. 
me and my friend, we were hyping up this movie, just saying this movie was legit scary. Then he went out and watched it and came back to work the next day and goes, I don't know what, I don't know what you two are talking about. That movie was not scary at all. And then similarly, I worked, there was another person I worked with and I remember we were talking about horror movies and I go, Oh dude, have you seen the conjuring too? And he goes, Oh, it was awful. I go, if by awful, you mean awfully good, then yeah, I agree. <laughs> But no, like he just thought it was complete trash. And I was just like, J- just get out. Don't talk to me. You know, like we can just be colleagues now. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother-in-law has the funniest reactions to movies like these. She will watch this movie from start to finish. Yeah. And you'll ask her, you know, no, what did you think? And she'll say, oh, it was very sad. <laughs> I'm like, that's your sole takeaway from this? She'll be like, yeah, yeah, it was very sad. You know, that one part? And I'm like, I don't know if we're watching the same movie now. Like, are you sure? Was it when the dog died? Probably. She might have just latched onto that. But yeah, like then other movies, like we watch them, I'm just like, no, did you, you know, if we watch like, say some serious drama, I'm like, no, did you think that that was a really funny comedy? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, look, I I still think that this movie is scary as (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah look i think it's a, i'm on the same as you I, I think it's scary but i don't think it changes the game too much i mean it's like a classic ghost possession horror movie that you get from like 80s and 90s it doesn't really reinvent the wheel too much but i think for me it was refreshing because it came out around the same time when the paranormal activity series were probably waning just yeah. dwindling down yeah it was tw- like it was probably on five or six by that point i don't know how many there are out there mm. but um everybody was over it over that i mean when the first paranormal activity came out i mean it was kind of like a game changer in a way but then second third fourth it just kind of used the same thing over and over and i think around that time as well zombie movies was also at its peak yeah and i think it was just a refre- really refreshing just to um you know just go back at a like a classic ghost ghost slash haunted house slash possession movie that you can enjoy because if you really think about it in terms of the plot and storyline there's nothing really new but what it scares you like what scares you was just the the techniques in terms of building up certain scenes and just with the music and the tension it just does it so well and the actors are great because people are probably used to like young good looking victims but this (laughs) is just like a nice couple (laughs) yeah like a nice family couple like a nice family with like you know kids and a lovable dog and trip don't take this the wrong way but that just sounded so creepy what you just said then nice looking victims i'm like surely you could have used a a different word but that was creepy as hell man no well there are some movies where like you know you actually don't care for the the people that end up being the victims (laughs) I think there was yeah. one that I watched with with the misses Sorority Row, and, oh, and every, man. Can every we not? single no. <laughs> well, like every single one of the every every single one of the cast were just like, unlikable. So yeah. like it, it actually, Jamie Chung, Jamie Chung was the only one that was likable. But that's no, she wasn't. You just think she's. I'm in love with her though. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, like none of them were actually likable. So then it ends up it ends up becoming more about the fun and seeing them get off whereas this one you know you're you're more emotionally invested in the characters but trip i think mm. you're right like it it doesn't really bring anything new to the horror game but i don't think it needs to i think it yeah. i think what you really see in this with james one is that it's a master really at work mm. this guy has seriously honed his craft in terms of doing in terms of scaring the crap out of people yeah. You know, like, and he's moved from he's moved from you know doing a slasher film like well slasher slash you know suspense mystery like Saw. Then he did something a little bit supernatural, which wasn't nearly as well received, but I think still scared the crap out of me. That Dead Silence, the one with the with the yeah, dummy. Oh, I love that movie. Oh, dude, yeah, like I was love that movie. I used to I used to go out. I used to like you know in the mornings. I used to actually like you know sort of stand outside. And, it, you know, just to wake up, you know, like get that cold air. Mm. After I saw that movie, I was like, nah, I'm not standing out in the dark by myself. No, no, forget it. Like, <laughs> oh, I just no. kept thinking I'm going to see that scary ass lady's face. 
<laughs> yeah, like if you, yeah, well, you know, we we could probably get into that one another day. But then, yeah, he moved on from doing stuff like that to this, and this movie was just like, oh man, it hits home on so many fronts. You're just like, yeah, like th- this is this is making me want to go back to church. <laughs> <laughs> Never too late. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm glad I blessed my house. I'm glad. <laughs> Yeah, that I'm baptized. Yeah. Oh gosh, like it was just, it was so scary. But a mate of mine, he said he he said it best. He goes, you know, like I noticed, I noticed that with these movies, it only tends to really affect all the all the Catholics and Christians. <laughs> but they weren't in this one. They they even said that we we you were not really religious. So they that 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 theory doesn't really sort of come into that sort of uh, play but ed and lorraine are yeah but but the but the, the go the the witch isn't actually affecting them it's affecting um the family no but the witch does try to go to go for them in a way yeah that's because they're standing in the way yeah. they came here to save the day and try to take over the perons but the warrens yeah they they're the way they're the people standing in the way from them to destroy the peron family so hmm. i don't know i mean this is what spawned the whole, like, like the whole franchise and slash universe. I mean, yeah, what they did here was amazing. So, not only you get a sequel, but you get all these spin-off series coming from it because they just created such an amazing universe from it. And it's all based off the real stories and recollections from the Warrens. So, I mean... We probably could do many podcasts just going through the other films and probably like what Dan says, we probably probably have to give him like a month's warning just to go over the next one if we have to. Oh, man. So, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I don't mind doing them, but I can, I, but please give me a month so I can just get it yeah, out of my mind. So you, my, mind. so you can wash your big boy pants because there's like skid marks or something on it. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you really came to play on this one, and and I appreciate it. You know, I know that you, you're not very fond of these character building experiences, but very glad that you put the big boy pants on for this. <laughs> oh man, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. I did enjoy. I did enjoy it. It's just any uh, like I like I said before, anything that has to do with possession does freak the crap out of me. Just simply because of the stuff I was told as a kid. You know, if if my if Lester and my mum never told me any of those stories i think i'd be all right to be honest i think i would have i think i would have been okay but no nah, this it hits it hits home too 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 hard for me on this one the the movie goes to and i think no it doesn't need great lengths to address any sort of plot holes in it but i thought it was really good how they touched on this so They've laid out the three rules to like how a possession, how ultimately a possession would take place. But people would probably say, like, why didn't this family just leave? You know, well, obviously, like real world problems. You know, the, the husband, he says, well, look, you know, a lot of our money is tied up in this place. So they can't just pack up and leave. Mm. But also the Warrens themselves, like when they initially investigate, they're like, OK, well, you know, as soon as as soon as Lorraine stepped in and met everyone, she noticed that there was an entity it was like that had latched onto them and it's feeding on them. You know, Ed himself, he says, you know, it's like gum. Once you've stepped on it, like it, it sticks to you and, it, and it'll just stay with you. And I thought that that was a really good way to sort of just tie that off, make yeah. sure that, you know, no one could sort of say, well, why didn't these idiots just leave the house, you know? But yeah, I was, I was really chilled seeing all that. But then also the, the ghost busting stuff, that was really fun. What did you guys think? If you've ever watched uh, like Ghost Hunters U- USA, Ghost Hunters UK, it was it's kind of like a, not not disappointing, but it's just it's kind of just like oh they're not as high tech. But then I I I got to remember this is this is meant to be in the, in the sixties, and all that stuff is obviously nowadays, you know. So I'm 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 waiting for the infrared uh, cameras to come out. I'm waiting for such and such to to, to pop out. But I, I, I for some reason I, I I couldn't switch that off my head and know that this is a uh, maybe to sit further further away. But once I once I did get past that later in the second viewing. It's very interesting how they did it. I'm like thinking, how did they come come around to sort of get know that this would be the the stuff to use to to capture any any ghost activity? You know what I mean? 
Like especially when they when they set the um the lights to to go off. Like I mean, yeah, there there was a bit where Ed's saying, "Hey, and she's not she's not she's not setting off uh the the the, the cameras so uh, or so camera or the lights uh something something starts seeing them off." Yeah, some someone's someone's with her. Yeah. Yeah. So like yeah, I think they say like you know drops in temperature and what have you that, that can that can trigger the cameras but also they've got the microphones there so that they can record any noises it, it, like it all looks very all very fancy and high tech but it's like a real life ghostbusters that you're watching this is a real deal and i i would be too scared to take part in any of these sorts of things in real life i, I don't know about you guys but oh, I, I i couldn't do it I watched this and I was, and me and the missus were like, we're totally going to go check out the Warren's Haunted Museum. Are you insane? Yeah, yeah. We were, we were like really, like we we're planning our trip and stuff and we we're like, yeah, yeah, we're definitely going to do it. And then we we're like, you know what? Nah, we'd probably be really susceptible to this stuff. And like, I think we, <laughs> I think we just, we just need to cancel that idea. Yeah. <laughs> what about, what about staying at like a haunted house, like overnight? Forget it forget it like they're even Come on, name your price man i'll give you a thousand bucks we do it for a thousand that is not nearly enough hey trip why don't you do it man no look, why can't... don't you do it bro how much money are you gonna give me my you just defend just defend your honor like you, 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 you you're saying you're, you're, you're saying you're so tough on all this why don't you why don't you you know just go do it yourself like I, yeah i would I, do it i already admit, i would do I it that give me I'm, some money no, for I'm, it. I, I'm not gonna give you money for it i just want to see if you well, do not? it I, I'd do it for money. I mean, like, like I said to, like, what Tim says, there's nothing to gain from it. I mean, I do believe in haunted houses and stuff, but hey, I'll do it for money. I mean, is it worth five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand? Name your price. Yes, this is the setup to another like, horror yeah, film. Exactly. Basically. Like, like licking a toilet bowl, Dan. Name your price. You'd lick it for a certain amount of money. No, I wouldn't. Yes, you would. No, I wouldn't. How does it? How about for ten thousand? No, like a toilet bowl that. for ten thousand. Fuck that. Fifty, hundred, <laughs> hundred thousand. Right, maybe you wouldn't do it for a hundred thousand. Maybe on. Lick the toilet maybe bowl. on. <laughs> Come on, man. I'll do it for a hundred thousand. Yeah, look, we've we've talked ourselves out of it. Like, you know, we you know, there's some Melbourne ghost tours and what have you, and we were like, yeah, yeah, we'd be totally down for this. Or even checking out the cemetery, we were like, yeah, yeah, we'd do that. I'm like, nah, nah. I think I'd, I think I'll. I'd like to just stay as far away from that as possible. <laughs> I want to get back to the the part with the with the sheet. That sheet scene far out. Like you just like everything's looking ideal and you know Ed and Lorraine are talking about like how much they they think that they would really enjoy moving out to the country having, you know, like a place like that, you know, how's the serenity type thing. But then yeah, the wind picks up. And you're like, what the heck is going on? Like, you know, yeah. So the wind, the wind picks up and, you know, you just know at that point, possession time is about to happen. So like, you know, once you see the, once you see Lorraine, she's like trying to like hang the sheets, all of a sudden one of the sheets flies off, goes onto the figure shape before it magically flies back. But then she sees a figure in the window. And just then you're just thinking, okay, like this is, this is, this is not going to be, this doesn't bode well for Carolyn who's in the house. Yeah. And just that bit where she wakes up screaming, but then all of a sudden a figure just levitates over her. And then like, once it goes into, into view of the camera and then you see the face, like that demonic face, mm. you're like, Oh my God, this is like, this is nightmare material right here. And then she vomits into her mouth. I was just like, yeah. ah, that, that just, <laughs> like, that just grosses me out now. <laughs> I, w I wish we watched this together because you just, if when that scene came out, you probably just would have heard me going, oh, 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 oh fuck this. <laughs> oh, oh, that, that, that was a horrible bit. No, you'd probably be like, yeah, spit in my mouth. <laughs> spit in my mouth, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Yes. All right. Well, well, we won't get into talking about what gets Dan's rocks off. <laughs> need to stay on task. Yeah. 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 No, we need, we need, we need to stay on point. We need to stay on point, but there's the, there's the cop character, Brad. And mm. you know, he, he just doesn't believe in anything that's happening until stuff starts happening to him. But there is a gag where uh, Drew, the assistant to the Warrens, he was showing the girl, the, the UV lamp 
to yeah. see like you know what the naked eye can't see the eldest daughter moves and then you know like ed and drew are talking but then they hear like a door opening like just this creaking noise and they're like okay all right you know something is about to kick off but then it turns out that it's just it's just brad he's just finishing up in the toilet i don't know i just thought it was really cool because at least you know like the movie the movie while it does make f several attempts to scare the crap out of you it also like has moments of levity like that yeah no that was good um and it, it was it wasn't done like you know like like some of the way that people uh horror movies do they they try to mix in the humor in it and but it simply comes off cheesy so that was actually like a really good way to segue into it I felt. Yeah, like, I just thought, you know, like, okay, yeah, like, that just sort of, you know, collective sigh of relief, okay, like, there's no, there's no, there's no, like, you know, haunting stuff happening right now, but yeah, like, I mean, this is probably, I, I reckon this movie was, would have to be, like, one of the best horror movies in the past decade. I think it is, I think it is regarded as the, the best. Like, anything, anything that James Wan has his handprint on, like, is, is pretty much pretty much guaranteed to be one of you know at least a solid scare for if if you're into horror films and yeah, yeah this one like it was just like just re-watching it i just felt that wow this was this was so good like even though i know when all the scares are going to happen like it is still creeping me out but looking at it from a technical level you're probably just appreciating it even more just with just like repeating and watching it i think you kind of get that when you yeah, re rewatch horror movies. I know. Yeah, just maybe go off on a little bit of a tangent. Just rewatching like Haunting of Hill House, just the mm. series, and there's so many little Easter eggs that the the directors did throughout the series by hiding little ghost figures throughout the episodes, and I thought that was just what that, that was awesome because I know it's such a character driven story, but just being just playing. Kind of like a Where's Wally game throughout the series, just spotting little ghosts here and there was also fun for me as well. And for this, back to this, in terms of The Conjuring, just seeing the setups and trying to, yeah, the build up and just appreciating the, yeah, I think just the little technical things from it is what I really appreciate about this. But for me, I guess like touching on like what was one of my favorite movies, favorite horror movies in the past decade, I, I would say Hereditary. Like, oh, yeah. this, yeah, this is, I think Conjuring is definitely up there. And I think, yeah, it was so successful as well because it, it kind of, it kind of broke a trend that was dying in the horror genre with the found footage slash, found footage slash, I don't know. Well, look, I'll say it's found footage because that, um, that was kind of, sort of like what paranormal activity was but it wasn't because mainly it was viewed through you know like hidden cameras and security cameras but then also it was um coming off the dying end of like the zombie movie genre as well like and i like i, I still love it but um it was coming near the end of it and this kind of kick-started a whole whole new thing that's been around for ages and this is why you have like a whole conjuring universe you know. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say, how do you guys think that the, the Conjuring stacks up against Insidious? Oh, Insidious wasn't scary for me. I mean, it, like, it, had, it had its jump scares, but this just scared me more than, than that. I feel like Insidious was sort of like the blueprint, and then the Conjuring was the, you know, the final product. Like, it, you know, like it was like where he was sort of like, you know, really just developing his... Because this... Insidious sort of delves more into other things like astral projection and, yeah. you know, psychic type stuff. And then, you know, the demons in that, like, you know, there are ghosts, but then there's that demon, which a lot of people sort of criticize. They said it didn't really look that scary. Whereas this is touching on Christian themes here and, and or Catholic themes, you know, like that sort of stuff, I think is a lot scarier in a horror movie. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think, yeah, and I think they had just so much material that they could go off as well from, like, the Warren cases, which are, you know, real-life people and who were, like, real-life paranormal investigators. So I think just from their books and stories and even their museums, they have this whole wealth of material that they can just go back on as well. Yeah. But for me, I think... Whenever Dan's ready to wear his big boy pants, I think we need to watch Hereditary. <laughs> yeah. 
there is something yeah. very chilling about that movie dude i think the trailer got me you when you first told me about it i watched the trailer i'm like just the sudden staccato of the violins like what the? like you know <laughs> it got me hooked it got me hooked because i don't know what's going on and even when i'm watching the and like not going into it too much but like watching the movie i'm like okay what's actually going on is it really demonic possession or is this is this woman just going through like some deep depression with everything that's going on and i think that's what really got me at the end because i was second guessing myself throughout the whole movie well yeah you were you were talking about music just before even the like this is just jumping right back to the beginning when the the title just sort of crawls up and then you hear like i think it's brass that's actually playing yes yeah, it goes like Bruh. oh man that just sticks with you doesn't it i think that scared dan as well <laughs> right you told me that scared you oh yeah like it's it, but that's but, but that that's what made it iconic for me it's like it, you, if you have a soundtrack that does something like that and oh it, it it, 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 will, it will always stick to you like the the music for some horror movies it might be like real might be just like really just cheesy or really crap but this one just from that opening bit you knew that this was going to be a scary movie automatically yeah well like you you also contrast well i mean the stuff that you read so you know like title crawl you, you read all this stuff you know based on a true story like it really sets the sets the scene quite effectively but you contrast that that brass sound from for you know like the credits for the conjuring with insidious insidious it's like this frenetic sounding crazy string rendition i don't know i don't even know what it was but like you know that was like it was just screeching i don't know like i don't know which one which one i want to say like i liked more because i actually liked them both quite well but i think this one would you know like and we've touched on this in other episodes but subtlety i think the subtlety behind this is probably where like what would win out and yeah it knows when to be subtle it knows when to lay it on quite hard especially with with the scares and yeah it's a it's an amazing it's like i can't i can't even put into words how much i'm i've enjoy i'm enjoying talking about this because i've just, i've enjoyed just re-watching it recently mm. it's just yeah the, the, this 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 movie has a, the whole package that you want in a in a scary movie i mean like let's let's get, let's delve into the cast I mean, I'm not gonna do no. I'm not, I'm not gonna do what we normally do. Where I read all everything. I'll just give just give just a couple of people who I think are not very very noteworthy. So we've got uh, Vi and I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna butcher this, but Vera uh, is it Far Famiga? Is that is that how you pronounce it? Yep, yep, yeah, yep. Famiga just, yep. and Patrick Wilson um, playing the 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 Warrens. Um, now, if you've ever seen what the Warrens look like, they look nothing like like them to a point. But both of them are very, very uh, talented, and I think what why I like to try to at least try to watch the Conjuring simply because of them. Because they're perfectly cast because they're likable, almost kind of superhero isk. I feel like because they just had that sort of he that that hero presence. Like, do you guys get that when you when you when you saw them on the screen? I just feel like they were pretty fearless. Um, yeah, I guess Laura Vera played a very good version of Lorraine who was both gentle but also fearless as well um you look at them yeah I get that feeling that they're you know just Sunday church goers but at the same time they're pretty fearless when it comes to confronting you know the forces of evil at the same time yeah she actually she actually sat with the real Lorraine Warren just to sort of get a feel for you know her mannerisms and what have you in preparation for the role and I think you know like well not having not having seen any interviews with you know the warrens i think what you said dan they they strike a very likable pair mm. and i really i really did enjoy their interactions together you know like as you know they they really do have that appearance of a loving couple i think that you know like as the main characters for this movie you want them to be likable and yeah, of you know the fact that they're they're going above and beyond to help people you know like, and even if it even if it means like going to someone's house and then seeing that and explain to them that really it's just the pipes or you know like in this case where they go you know the extra mile just to find out what it is that's happening it's like clear as day that these people are haunted yeah you, you you're immediately on their side 
Well, that's that's a good point about the, about the story that I liked about. It. I think that's why uh, we love them as a character because they actually do go to places and actually specifically say this, and say that nine nine times out not, not, well, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but nine times out of ten, it's not it's 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 usually not really haunted. M- most uh, I think paranormal investigators, whenever they're portrayed on. Um, in any sort of media, they're like, "Oh yeah, this is this is normal. This is you know, this is what happened." But this is to actually show them that you know, oh, okay, this is they actually do go out to make sure, li- literally, uh, make sure that people are okay, and that's I think that's what makes them likable as well. Uh, and we've got Lily Taylor and Ron Livingston as uh, Carolyn and Roger. Before before we go into into that casting, do you guys remember Ron Livingston? Because I kept if, while while was this, I kept wondering like he's a handsome bloke. I can't remember where I've seen him from, and it wasn't until I did my my delving I went, okay, what is this? I, I don't know about Ron Livingston so much, but he did look very familiar. If I said Office Space, would you would that sort of? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I was shocked. I, I was like, I know this guy, but where where is he from? And then he did this like this little tweak with his mouth, and I went, is that the guy from Office Space? So I went, when I went to look, I went, oh my gosh, man, has he come a long way? Well, probably one of his more iconic roles, but you know, like he he does play that everyman sort of character quite well, and I think he brought that level of realism and believability to him playing a family man in this. But the uh, like this is this is where I just wanted to ask your guys' opinion. What did you guys feel about the exorcism at the end? The family, you know, they've figured out what what this is. So the Warrens are racing back to the Perons. The Perons are meant to be at a motel, but when they get there, it turns out that Carolyn has taken two of the daughters and driven them back to the house. Reminded me a lot of reminded me a lot of uh, Haunting of Hill House trip. Mm. Like you know, just being you know just being drawn back to the house and you know you know being coerced into doing the bidding of of the you know well not the demonic house in this case, but more the the demonic entity Bathsheba. Like I, I found it, I found it quite chilling, but also very reminiscent of The Exorcist. Did you guys get a sense of that as well? Not really. I, uh, I just, I didn't get that feel of it. I, I just felt like it was just a. This is probably just my own opinion, but it'd be very different to yours. But I just felt like it was just a, a typical horror trait. I didn't really read into into that. I just went, okay, they're just taking it back just to throw it, to, to throw it back into the story. Okay, fair enough. That, and that's how I saw it. More so, okay, well, more so what I thought was really reminiscent of The Exorcist was just the way, the, the way that the light played with things. So, you know, you're expecting to see Carolyn, but instead you see the grotesque yeah, yeah. You know, face of Bathsheba. You know, like she's gone full full demon mode here. And like just when I saw that, I was like, okay, yeah, like that kind of reminds me a bit more of that. And I mean, look, it, admittedly, it has been many, many years since I've seen The Exorcist. I haven't been able to put my big boy pants back on for that one. But I think that, yeah, like there was, there were just so many things to this that just hark to me. It harkened back to older horror films, and that's that. That's probably where a lot of the enjoyment comes up. It's an old style horror film done for modern audiences, and it just it just works on so many levels. But yeah, even uh, this is this is a bit of trivia. But I was reading this article: the surviving the Peron kids now grown up, they actually got to visit the set while they were filming, and they were saying that you know the bit where in the movie Carolyn is tied to a chair, has a sheet over her face. She obviously, she manages to rip through it, and then you see Bathsheba underneath the, the sheet instead. But the bit where the chair levitates, they were saying that that kind of happened in real life. Mm. So rather than having an exorcism because they're not ordained and, and they're not authorized to do any sorts of exorcisms, they actually had a seance. And during the seance, Carolyn's chair ended up levitating. And this is what the... The eldest daughter in the family attests to. She swears that this happened. The the chair levitated, and the the mother started speaking in, I think, tongues. 
Oh, that's that messes me up. Thanks, Tim. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Thank yep, you. So, sorry, like that. That does. Now that I've finished saying it, I'm like, okay, this wasn't just info to, to be shared with everyone. And and fun fact, <laughs> this is actually nightmare material for you both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm not going to sleep tonight. I'm not going to sleep tonight. Jeez. <laughs> but when you when you talk about that, yeah, just the the final act and having it being done back at the house I, I think it's i think it's fitting because the house the house itself is almost like a character in its own way because it's set up it's been set up throughout the whole movie there was just so much stuff happening at the house rather than to have the final showdown done at a motel or some other place to take it all back to the house i think it's it's fitting for that so but i can i kind of understand what you were talking about with um just the flickering lights and all that for me watching the exorcist yeah it's it grosses me out and also when i first saw it, i haven't yeah i think likewise as well i haven't seen it for a while but i just remember just being grossed out and also just um it was also very draining in terms of just the exorcism itself while this one yeah it was more short and sweep it with a little few twists here and there that's true yeah i mean like with yeah. it, it felt like this was expedited you know, the, in, in the exorcist, that's really a war of attrition, you know, a battle of wills mm. that's going on. That's, that, that, that's a that's, good choice of words, man. I love it. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it is, it, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's to see who will win out. Like who's got the, who's got the stronger will between the demon and the priests mm. here. It feels like, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the movie, but it does feel like it, it was, it was really just quite rushed. But it's still kind of, I think it still kind of served its purpose for, you know, again, you know, like with, with a lot of horror movies, you know, you want to reach that catharsis at the end. And yeah, it is very cathartic at the end when they manage to cast out the demon. They know its name and that, you know, they've done their research. They've, they've researched the heck out of the land and who previously lived there. And so they're able to cast it out. I'm glad that this movie had a happy ending as opposed to Insidious Part 1, at least. Insidious one, like that, that leaves you a very haunting impression. But this one, yeah, like, you know, after everything that, you, that had gotten you onto the edge of your seat, this movie finally leaves off with something that, that results in a happy ending for all. And also the Warrens go off on, you know, on their, on, on the rest of their adventures because at the very end they tease Amityville horror. Yeah. It, it's definitely a, because of their careers, it's, it, it's something that's very ripe for, for a movie universe, so yeah, like I'm, I'm definitely down for more sequ for more sequels from from James Wan or or you know his his uh, partners for these. Mm. Can we just say Lily Taylor as Carolyn? What a perfect choice to to play. She did she played her role so well. She was scary in the bits that she needed to be scary. She was sympathetic in the bits where she needed to be uh, sympathetic. He heavily underrated actress she is, and I, I wish she'd get more parts like this. What else has what else has she been in, Dan? Um, I'll just bring it up because she hasn't really been because uh, she hasn't really been in anything really big that I'm aware of. Like she's like done like like mainly like six foot six foot under, almost human, Public Enemies, and then she was in one of the Maze Runner movies, and yeah, it wasn't it like her career isn't really sort of there. But well, she was also in a really. She was in a crappy remake of uh, oh, the, the the House on Haunted Hill. Yeah. yeah. I forgot about House that. House on Haunted Hill had Jeffrey Rush in it. Hey, I, Owen Wilson. I actually like that movie. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. My, look, my sister, she, I'm pretty sure she screamed all throughout the first Conjuring film. But <laughs> I still vividly remember when we watched like House on Haunted Hill or whatever. And that's a that's a real product of the nineties. Like that looks like a music mm. video, basically. That was that was ninety nine, right? Ninety yeah, nine, like, ninety nine. Yeah. She started watching the movie like at just like right in front of the TV, and with each successive scare uh, or scream on her part, she kept jumping back until like towards the end of the movie, she was actually watching from like the hallway, like <laughs> in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I think if I if I manage to convince her to watch this again as well as the sequel, my job will be done. I'm I'm going to be very happy if I can get her to watch them. Well, we've gone through everything we need to go. The main thing we need to ask, like we do always on What If It's Cool, is it cool? 
Oh, hundred percent. I think that was yeah. I think that was covered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it it is cool. I just reckon don't watch it uh, alone, especially don't watch it at night alone. Uh, it's just one of those movies where you just you're gonna be like me, uh, watching it back every couple of minutes, and um, yeah. Uh, <sighs> I'm gonna after you telling that story, uh, Tim. Uh, I'm get, not gonna be able to sleep tonight. So thanks for that. Enjoy, sweet dreams. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sometimes I wonder why I'm friends with you guys. I really do. When we have to watch, when we have to watch movies like this, uh, we'll watch things you like next time. Then, yeah, yeah, I doubt romantic that comedies and yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> oh, dude. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, CastBox, and of course iTunes. And while you're there, leave us a like and review. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button and enable those notifications. Make sure to follow us on Facebook at What If It's Cool Podcast, tweet us at at What If It's Cool, and find us on Instagram at What If It's Cool Podcast. Keep that support going. And until next time, folks, we'll catch you on the next cast. Peace.